Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream event on the 22nd of September 2020. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance and it's great to have you on board once again. And uh, we've got a uh, great show for you this evening. Uh, we've already got um, over 300 on the stream, so well done. And uh, thanks for coming on early to catch those early pearls of wisdom from Chris Bates, who's queued up, ready to come in just a second. Just before I bring him in, I just want to uh, take you through just my normal uh, reminders. Just to be clear, this isn't financial advice. Uh, we don't know your individual situations. Uh, this is just a general conversation about property and those things that we both uh, spend time looking at. Uh, please play nice in the chat room. No racial slurs. Plexus is moderating the stream as always. Thanks, Plexus. Really appreciate your help. This is as at the 22nd of September 2020. So if you're watching this in replay, many years down the track, you'll know whether we were right or whether we were wrong or somewhere in between. Um, if you want to uh, get hold of me, leave a message in the chat. Use at Walk the World to get my attention because otherwise I may not see it. A lot of conversations. We encourage those conversations in the chat, but uh, I won't necessarily see them all. And I've also enabled Super Chat, which enables you to do two things. One is to make sure that your question goes to the top of the list if you uh, want to get your question out. And secondly, uh, if you would like to make a donation to Funding DFA, uh, this, isn't a this is not a for-profit enterprise. It's very much covering our costs, all contributions greatly received. So with that uh, introduction out of the way, um, I now want to bring uh, Chris Bates in. So let me just push a couple of buttons. So I'm going to push that one. I'm going to push uh, that one. And then I'm going to go there. Chris Bates, can you hear me? Martin, I can hear you loud and clear. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Welcome to this uh, streaming event. Uh, we're, uh, we've got uh, nearly 400 on the stream now, so that's uh, pretty good. Um, your audio is uh, good and strong. We may just take it back slightly, but uh, all good. Now, um, thank you very much for carving out some time on this Tuesday evening and uh, spending it with us. It really is appreciated. Um, some of those on the channel will, of course, know you from the uh, shows that you do with me. And, of course, you also do Elephant in the Room and all sorts of other exciting things too. So uh, definitely around on socials and all of those things. But it's really good to have you with us and so we can pick your brains directly. Yeah, now, let's do it. Yeah, great. And um, I've got a bunch of questions already, but let's just uh, start at the beginning with a bit about uh, the Chris Bates story. So you're a mortgage broker. How long have you been in the industry? How did you get into mortgage broking? And uh, what have you learned from uh, your journey so far? So, I mean, I'll, I'll try to not waste too much of your listeners' time giving my whole life story. Um, but I've been around finance for about 16 years, uh, an accountant, funds management, then financial advisor for 13 years, just until recently. Um, we came a mortgage broker back in 2013, um, and that's all we do now is broking. Um, and, and I guess the guidance around the property decision. So the financial planning mindset um, is kind of our approach, uh, how we go uh, talk clients through what they're doing around property, and um, but we don't do financial advice in-house anymore, um, and we just focus 100% on broking. Um, what was the final part to that question, Martin? What, what have you learned from your journey? So I came into broking very ignorant, um, probably arrogant as well as you, you know, you think, oh, financial advisor, how hard could mortgages be? But there is a big, steep learning curve and a lot has changed with the industry. Um, it got a lot tighter over those years. I remember when I was first looking at how much people can borrow and I was like, I didn't know people could borrow this much, you know, 10 times salary, even more. Um, got a lot tighter. We had the Royal Commission, uh, but surprisingly, all that seems to... Uh, kind of died off. I mean, the toothless tiger ASIC has just walked away from the, the battle um, at the final hurdle and just said, oh, no, there's a recession. We can't be tied on the banks right now. So it's been a, it's been a learning curve. Ultimately, though, um, you know, it, show, it has taught me how credit flow, access to credit rates um, have a huge impact on the market. And um, yeah, and, and how much people can borrow has a huge impact. And all the changes APRA did with assessment rates, you know, how does that affect um, borrowing capacities? And so you get all these insights. I think that's another thing, I'm not trying to ramble on, but uh, you know, you get a lot of insights seeing lending because you're seeing people when they're thinking about, you know, they should be thinking about it. Uh, sometimes they come to me when they've already purchased a property, but you know, a lot of the time it's very early on and you can already see what people are doing. You know, I'm gonna wait till next year, I'm gonna, you know, push on, I'm a bit nervous about works, etc. So yeah, you get a lot of different views on the property market by being quite one of the first people to see demand, I guess. 
Right, yeah, and that's the point, isn't it? Because, of course, the first thing that happens when people think about property is to think about financing and how you're going to finance it, all of that sort of stuff, which means that you're right there at the, uh, the front end of the process. Mm. Now, um, let me just ask this question, because there's been a lot of stuff written about banks' lending standards. You know, are they looser? Are they tighter than they were three or six months ago? And, of course, through the Royal Commission, they were really quite a lot tighter. I think the banks mm. got a real shock. Um, what's the truth at the moment from your perspective? You know, are, 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 are banks looser, tighter, uh, or what? So they're still nervous around self-employed, um, but nowhere near like they were in April, uh, March time, when there was really no, no understanding of how the company was going to survive and, um, yeah, really tight. Uh, bonuses, some banks have tightened up, some banks have potentially loosened up with how much percentage they'll use. I think that the view of credit, though, and how they look at files... Um, you know, we do a lot of work with, say, Macquarie, right? And Macquarie, one of the first ones to tighten, and they tightened extremely fast. But, you know, their kind of mentality now is kind of getting on with it again. So I would say that they've kind of back, you know, and I think living expenses was always the big elephant in the room. It was when I joined the industry. I was like, so no bank checks living expenses. Everyone's done on minimum living expenses. Um, and that's just the way it is. Uh, and that's just, there was a consensus view out there in broking. The banks would all do it. Um, then the Royal Commission happened and everyone went to like uh, like a forensic look at living expenses. Um, and now a lot of the banks are sitting on the fence. Some are like dialing it back. Some are even looking at it, but spending is really low anyway because of COVID. So, um, yeah, it's, I, I'd say arguably it's back to kind of how it was. I can't really see. We're not getting declined loans or, or things like that. Right, and that's quite significant because, of course, there was a stage when a lot of loans were being knocked back. What about loan-to-value ratios? Um, are banks still willing to lend at high LVRs or are they being a bit stricter on that? Um, I think that the mortgage insurers are a little bit nervous more than the banks. Um, they're still willing to do it. Um, you can still get 90% no LMI if you're in certain professions. Westpac did dial that back a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can still definitely get, you know, loans at 90%. We, to be honest, don't do any loans over 90%. Um, I think we've got one at this 5% deposit. We just don't really play in that market too much. But um, yeah, we, we regularly do loans at 88, 90% and have no problems. Mm, okay, very interesting. Now, we should just talk a little bit about the profile of the sort of people that you work with as, as, as clients or customers, because you tend to carve out a particular segment of the market, don't you, where you spend most of your time? Yeah, so we got uh, profession-wise everything probably. We do a lot in construction, a lot in tech, uh, you know, even a lot of the banks actually, even though they get uh, internal bank policies, sometimes they come to us just for the guidance. Um, so, it doesn't, you know, uh, lots of different industries from the employment, but generally speaking, we, we are in the family double income market. Um, that's sort of where we specialise. And so a lot of our clients are buying houses, um, you know, 1 to 1 1.5, maybe that's their first home, or upgrading that sort of anywhere upwards from that um, and we do a lot of purchases a lot of brokers do a lot of refinances um, I guess coming at from a planning point of view I, I just don't find them that interesting um, and you know I, I really like guiding someone through that emotional purchase and, and getting the keys and making sure they don't buy an off-the-plan apartment or they don't go and buy a townhouse or a duplex or on a busy road so I spend a lot of time educating them on the actual property that they're buying now we don't see ourselves as buyers agents we know where our knowledge will finish then we bring in the local experts so if someone's buying on the northern beaches we've got someone there someone's buying inner west it's a different person eastern suburbs melbourne you know it's always different buyers agents that we work with and that's a big mistake i see a lot of property people do is they get a relationship with one person and then funnel all their clients to someone and they think that everyone's the same but you know every single one of our clients even though you wouldn't think they're all similar but they're all doing different things and that's um and that's a good thing mm. well it's very interesting that you make that point because i've been running my dfa one-on-one -on -one sessions for about uh, six to eight weeks now i've had more than 100 conversations with individual people thinking about property you know whether they're first-time buyers up traders down traders you know uh, and what's fascinating is that um i've got a huge uh additional set of insights now about the way people are thinking about property it's quite diverse um, some of the questions they're asking it's very diverse as well um, so it you know I always always comes back to what we keep saying and we just say it again not one size fits all you know there are a lot of different parameters and permutations around property property purchases because people are different they're 
buying different types of property in different locations with different problems. Um, and it, that's quite fascinating. But, you know, perhaps a bit later on in the conversation, we might talk about some of the characteristics of some of them that I've seen. Um, but I do think it's important to, to underscore that there is no one size fits, fits all rule here. Yeah, the investor market is the interesting one. I think it's like non-existent. Um, you know, the investors that were in the market um, have basically been burnt because they didn't really know. This is not a shot at all. Hindsight's easy, but, you know, they didn't really know what they were doing. They thought that the accumulation of quantity of properties was better than the actual quality, um, you know, and they would buy it cheaper because they thought it was less risk. They thought the loan value would de determine the risk, not the quality of the property. Um, and so a lot of those investors that did have, you know, one, two, three, four, um, are all in trouble and they've been stressed about interest only. They've been stressed about refinancing. They've been stressed about their capital value. So they're going nowhere near it, if anything, trying to offload it. And even those first time investors, the people looking to buy their first investment property, there's so much news out there. And I guess that, you know, concern that they're just unsure and they're just going to sit on their hands. So the investor markets, you know, just non-existent, which, um, yeah, all the, all the numbers sort of back that up. <laughs> well, that's certainly what I'm seeing, Chris, as well in my surveys, that uh, property investors are sitting on the sidelines, in fact, probably looking to sell, um, partly because the rentals are squeezed. The uh, bulletin last week from the Reserve Bank highlighted the fact that, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne's rentals are significantly down. And, of course, there's no capital growth um, in many areas. That means that, effectively, you can't make the investment uh, calculation work. The other point, of course, is that with low interest rates, um, the negative gearing potential is reduced. And people have forgotten about that. But that's something else just to bear in mind. Uh, and, you know, what I find is that when you talk to people about their property investments and when you start adding in all of the costs of the property and servicing and everything else, right? And then you, you know, you basically run a, a cash flow model over it. Um, you know, there are more losing money than making money at the moment because it's all about capital growth. And if there's no capital growth, there's, there's no return. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, unless you're using cash and if you use cash, there's an opportunity cost. So you need to factor that into your returns of property. So generally speaking, everyone's people are borrowing for buying investment properties. The cost of interest plus strata, plus maintenance, et cetera. You know, even if you're getting a four or 5% yield, um, and even if you make 6% yield, you have to pay tax on any sort of net positive. So um, there's never really much money. You might make five bucks a week or 50 bucks a week. It's it's not gonna give, make your um, life change direction. All it comes down to is property investment is the capital value. And where does that go over the term that you hold that property? And with the transaction costs of, you know, eight to 10%, depending on how you wanna look at it, um, and then you know you've got the all the op the negative gearing cost and the opportunity cost and you know risk and market going down like you know a lot of people will be just thinking you know what have i really got out of that over 10 years and a lot of people it's not very pretty right and then if you add inflation over the top which is the other thing i always do in all, all of my models just to highlight the fact that you know values are being eroded by inflation all the time um whatever the inflation number is right and if you add that in as well then it gets even worse <laughs> that's true as well so that's your kind of opportunity cost there you should be making on your money but you're not uh and so yeah no i'm on the same part now um one of the um, questions which is coming through it came through before uh, from a couple of people as well and it, it, it's the thorny question of the the property portals and the information in the property portals right and you know we could spend a whole show just on that i think but there are three parts of the question the first is um what can you really tell about what's going on in the market from what the publicly available information is? How accurate is it? And how myopic is it? And frankly, do you use those portals to help or do you actually use other tools which are not generically available to uh, the general public? So w I guess when you're looking at the portals, you're looking to find to figure out what are the sale prices. If that's what you really want to find out. Mm. Um, and then a lot of them are saying price undisclosed, right? Um, but if you really want to find out what the sale of that price of that property is, and you're active in the market, it doesn't take long to figure that out. If you went to the auction, you would have found out. If you uh, know the agent, I mean, I called a, a local agent the other day just for a chat, and he told me the price of a couple of properties that were undisclosed, you know? Um, and so you can very, that's probably the only way you can really find out. It's just Befri you know, befriending the agents really uh, and just staying in that market if you really want to find out you hit the ground running you'll be able to see 
what's happening. To be an armchair sort of sitting on the and never going out in the market and then you're never really going to understand what's truly happening because it's not just the sale price. It's like how many people bid it at that auction? You know, was it six? Was it seven? So if there was six or seven people, that means there's five or six that, you know, has still looking for a property that had that budget that were pre-approved that are active in that market. You know, how many people are going to the open homes? How many people are going twice, three times? Um, you know, we had a client last week trying to buy up in the Central Coast, looked at the property on Wednesday. It was so underpriced. I was like, he's basing that on a completely wrong comparable. Um, you know, it was like 870 and it ended up selling for 1.1 on Saturday, like literally three hours after the open inspection. So, um, you know, and there was a three-way bidding war on it because it was a good property, great location, um, great price point, entry point for a lot of first home buyers in a great suburb. Um, so, you know, like that's how you would really know what's happening. It was a hot sort of competition. But, you know, a lot of times you'll go to the open auction and it'll pass in and there'll be no one there, etc. That's a great barometer, you know, especially if it's a good property, if it's not selling. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't think the portals are really there to be used as gospel, obviously. Um, you know, they're great to see what listings are. But a lot of off markets are happening at certain points as well. And so you've got to be active in the market buying to actually truly know what's coming on, what's selling. Right. And those off markets, um, you know, I see a lot of that in my um, analysis as well. Um, and, and there are two flavors. Firstly, there is the, the flavor of off market where there are people just saying, well, you know, if somebody wants to off make me a silly offer, then I might be interested, right? And then there's, and there's the other where the, effectively the properties come on the market, hasn't got done very well, maybe they've used that two or three times and it still hasn't sold. Um, so they, they sort of don't proactively list it, but the agents know it's there. Um, so you need to be a little bit cautious, don't you, with off market stuff? Yeah, and then you've got the properties who just won't present well. You know, they can't style a, you know, a roof that's falling in, et cetera. The, the vendor hasn't got the money to do that. So it's going to look pretty awful on the portal. So, you know, they'll probably push that through. You get lots of properties selling pre-market. So, um, you know, because at the, you know, if, if when the market's hot and if you're a seller and you think that uh, it's always, you, know, you went to the auction up the road and you can see how hot it was and you saw it go for a big price, you know, you've got a good property. You're going to want to let it run through the auction campaign. But in times where there's a little bit of uncertainty, especially things like Corona, you know, and around the, what's going to happen, if you get a good offer and pre-market, it's so, the, you know, in the market, the agent calls you up and says, I've got this coming on next week. Do you want to have a look at it? Um, or a buyer's agent definitely gets a lot of, a lot of these pre-markets. Um, one good offer before could just take it off the market. So, you know, it is something to... In the past, you're right, a lot of it is people just being a bit wishful thinking and saying to the agent, if you find someone desperate, we're willing to sell it at 2.5. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's not always that. Sometimes it, it could just be that the vendor just wants a quick sale. Yes, obviously that uh, is there sometimes too. Now, what about this uh, issue of the prices um, not actually being disclosed. So not only at auctions, but you actually see when a property has been sold, they'll often quote the last asking price rather than the negotiated price, right? And um, in some cases, they don't disclose anything. And in fact, uh, I saw some information the other day that suggests perhaps one third of properties are now being uh, shown on the portals without any price information at all. Now, what do you read into that? I mean, I think, yeah, you've, you've, the portals itself are... Like, I mean, I, there was um, a property I remember looking at last year and it was like whoever was, the agent somehow knew the way to get around the system and was putting it under like 1.5, let's say. It was, a, it was some figure. And then it was going to sell it over $2 million. And so the portal was somehow the agent was playing the system because it was trying to get people in a lower price bracket. So, I mean, I don't really, to be honest, if, if, what if, if you're wanting to know about the property market and you're wanting to know about certain areas... It's very easy to just hit the ground, go to open homes, go to auctions, speak to agents, figure out how much demand there is, and then the type of property that you want to buy, how many are listing, how many are staying on the market, how many are just sitting there, you know, going stale, how many rentals are sitting on the market. And if you're trying to buy a property and all that's happening, then it's a great sign to be, you know, heading the other way. But if you're in a market where very little listings, strong demand for the type of property that you want, um, you know, days on market's pretty low, that's going to give you a lot of insight. So, um, you know, especially if you own property, um, you always want to know what's happening in that sort of area and, and be aware of the supply risk or aware of demand shifting 
away from your type of property for some reason. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you can track things on portals and kind of talk about the macro thing. But I think if you truly want to look at property, properties, you're buying individual assets, you're not buying indexes. So what you really want to know is that market that where that property is, what's happening, get on the ground and, and do the do the hard yards. <laughs> No, very good. Um, there's a wonderful comment here from Happy Robot saying, property goes up, Martin, don't be silly. Who needs to check prices? Properties go up, it's physics. Uh, it's in the same category as, uh, you know, properties double every 10 years, right? Yeah, well, I don't, yeah, obviously, you know, I don't subscribe to that um, theory. Uh, you know, we could easily sit, you know, out of 10 and a half million properties, if we started to cut that back and see how many properties are actually doubling every 10 years, you'd be uh, pleasantly surprised. Um, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Joe's asked about um, the APRA and ASIC uh, regulatory framework. You know, they've kicked out basically. Um, you know, you can report loans as not bad. You know, if they're re you know resettled. And of course, some um, APRA basically has loosened the uh, responsible lending criteria. But th those will come to an end at some point. Um, Chris, what's your perspective in terms of what they've done? And also, what do you think the impact will be when those perhaps are reversed uh, next year? So um, defaults are going to more likely be in areas where there's other defaults. You know, they, they're going to be in a cluster. Um, you can see this uh, very, I mean, you've got lots of data on this, Martin. I know that uh, where there's going to be more likely to be stressed in certain areas. And so you can look at a, a headline figure and say arrears of 2%. What does that really tell you, though? It only tells you that as a 2% of properties or 2% of loans that are, are really struggling, right? So, but where are they 8%? Where are they 10%? You know, what are they in the areas that you want to buy? Um, and so what you'll find is that generally in a lot of areas that most people want to buy, um, in the streets that most people want to buy, 30, 40% of the properties are paid off. So don't worry about arrears on those. 30, 40% have got very low debt um, or have access to other funds or you know, I've got professional jobs and maybe one person still working or have access to. So, you know, they're, they're not going to be right. Then 10 or 20 are potentially bought in the last five years. Um, and so, you know, it depends on maybe they're potentially at risk and maybe 80 percent of those are still going to be OK. So now you're down to, you know, 5 percent of the market. Um, now, if 5 percent of the market did list um, gradually, you know, undersupplied market, it wouldn't make a difference. And so but if you were in a market where you know, 30, 40% are in trouble um, and, you know, 20% of the properties list, for example, house and land packages um, where you've got a lot of young couples with 90% mortgages, um, maybe one person working because it's a young family with maternity leave or um, part-time work, etc. That person loses their job, no other access to money, everything, they've got no access to credit or they've capped out. Um, and then you can see there's going to be a massive problem in those sort of areas. Then you've got new supply hitting, which is newer than yours, and the same as apartment markets. So, yeah, I mean, I love all these sort of big numbers and things like that. But what I think you do is you go much more granular and you look at the areas and the assets that you own or want to buy. Yeah, I mean, granular is the key, isn't it? Because you really have to get local. Uh, and the other thing I'd say, uh, Chris, is that of all the information sources I use, um, you know, the, the, the value of general information in New South Wales, where they actually list all the transactions once they've been settled, is by far the most definitive source of information. It surprises me how few people know about that great tool. Yeah, that's right. So you're just kind of tracking it after it all goes in the title's office, etc. But I mean, yeah, I think if you really want it, but there's a lag, right? So how many how many months, sometimes longer settlements and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I, I think if you're looking for the actual real time, you can just hit the ground running, go to a few options. You know, <laughs> I know that's not a, you can find out straight away, like literally yep. right now, how many yep. people are pre-approved, ready to go. Um, obviously, you can't do that in Melbourne, which I, you know, shout out to all the people in Melbourne still going through a bit of nonsense, so I feel for you. Absolutely. Okay, now one of the other subject uh, areas, Justin C, for example, said, how many more times will the government allow people to withdraw from super, you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth? But, but there's a broader question here about the, the superannuation element. Um, have you seen much evidence of that influencing what people are doing? Uh, we spoke about this offline very briefly, Martin, and I was never a fan of it. Um, I'm sure people were typing away in their comments and how dare you say, uh, don't let people access their super. But um, unfortunately, 
when it first happened, I said, this is not going to end well. You're going to see people, um, it's going to be great for the economy. It's potentially not going to be great for the people's financial futures. Uh, and people are going to spend it extremely fast and it's going to get pumped into their markets. And the amount of stimulus that that created was huge. And you've got all the stats on this, Martin, you're that numbers guy there. But yeah, let's say it's $20 billion or something, right? Massive um, free money into the market. Um, and Ilion, we, had, we did, uh, I think it's Simon Bly, the CEO of Ilion came on the podcast a couple of weeks ago and showed how, you know, 40% of that money roughly went in the first two weeks, big chunk on online shopping, you know, takeaways, gambling, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I was never a fan of that policy. And I think I just didn't know it was in the toolkit. And all of a sudden, bang, you can ta- access your super fund, you know, $20,000, you know, limited questions asked. Um, so, yeah, I, who knows what the government will do. Obviously, they'll do anything, everything it takes, which uh, Mr. Draghi once said. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. But it's just worth sort of, you know, quantifying. $19 billion is the, yeah. is the net contribution to, uh, if you like, the, the cash flows, right? Um, job keeper and job seeker were about $7 billion apiece, right? So the superannuation release was a bigger injection of liquidity than job keeper and job seeker combined, and in fact, to put that in perspective, the additional value created by the repayment principal and interest repayment holidays is about somewhere between two and three billion. Right. Mm. So, the superannuation thing was was a huge, you know, stimulus flow, but a lot of it got evaporated. You know, buying utes and things, and of course, the the latest data from APRA is showing that now the withdrawals are pretty much tailing off. So that is already being withdrawn, and of course, then we have job keeper and job seeker. So all that stimulus that we saw is essentially now being uh, sucked out of the system at the point when, in fact, uh, a lot of uh, people are in some difficulty. So one of the theses that I run um, is that we ain't seen nothing yet. We're in this sort of the eye of the storm, as it were, and then ahead we're going to see much more significant downdrafts simply because of all this stimulus being being with, withdrawn but i did also see in my surveys that some of those superannuation uh, withdrawals were actually directly put into a deposit to buy a house so that is definitely one of the factors in there not just for everyday expenditure yep yeah we've seen that the banks absolutely hate it it shows that you've uh you're going through a bit of hardship in the bank's eyes and they're like well how can we possibly give you you know a million dollar loan if you're in hardship and you've got to take money out of your super fund. So uh, it doesn't look good. A lot of banks will look at three months of bank statements, for example, and a lot of people paid it into their transaction account, so there's no hiding it. Um, but I mean, it is September now. Maybe they did the first tranche, they didn't do the second tranche. Um, so the banks probably won't even know about it, etc. So yeah, it is. And I think the, the payment holidays is another thing. You've got the $10,000 in super, but actually, you know what we'll do is give everyone six months holidays on their mortgage. I just didn't think that was even possible as well. I thought when you sign a mortgage up, you you pay it no matter what. Um, and so that's a, a bit of a shock. And I just think the banks have been pretty relaxed on getting people back paying. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, if people do it or they just keep trying to get a four-month extension. You know, if lo- everyone asks for a four-month extension, good luck to their bank service teams trying to approve it. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I think they all got a bit of a cop out. We um, were very concerned about, not concerned, I mean, a lot of the big property investors who have gone and built, you know, big portfolios, leveraged themselves to the hilt, have bought poor assets and um, have banked on interest only being around um, and they could always refinance. It's hard to kind of sit there and go like, I'm, you know, et cetera. But what they've allowed them to do is just get another 12 months interest only, no questions asked. You can move your home loan to interest only for 12 months, no question asked. So, you know, if you get to 12 months time down the line, bearing in mind a lot of people had their home loans interest only when the interest rate was exactly the same five years ago. Um, so, you know, if you're 12 months time, do they just give another 12 months extension? So, uh, you know, it makes sense, right? Like that's from the bank's point of view. So, yeah, I think the... Um, and all that would do, that's a huge impact. When you've got interest rates at, you know, 2.5, 2.6%, maybe, you know, high twos for interest only, uh, you know, just paying that for 12 months is, is a huge reduction to your cash flow if you're paying interest and your mortgage stay had 25 years left. You'll be amazed at how much that reduces your cash flow. Yeah, no, you're right about that. And interestingly, APRA um, put out another letter today to the, uh, the, the ADIs with regard to how they were dealing with this question of, contacting um, customers about their principal interest repayment holidays. Um, and basically, APRA said, 
you've got to be persistent. You've got to actually try multiple channels to be able to get these um, conversations going because, in fact, some of the banks basically said, well, we tried and didn't manage to get in contact with people, right? So which um, suggests they weren't really trying very hard. Yeah. And they also talked about the governance processes within the banks that are required to control all of this because, again, I think APRA is concerned that the banks may not be doing what they should be doing in terms of trying to explore options for people. And, you know, I've said and I'll say it again, it seems to me that around a quarter of those people will be able to start repaying no problem. Um, another quarter at the other end will have major issues and will probably have to get out in some way or the other and the other 50% will be able to do something and probably interest and principal or principal only or interest only I should say is probably what that is going to be but it's quite complicated but the volume of work and the number of people that the banks are going to throw at it and are having to throw at it is pretty astronomical and those costs of course have to be picked up by somebody somewhere along the, on, along the road as well so that's another factor to bear in mind here there's no such thing as a free lunch when it comes to all of these conversations yeah i think that uh, that's probably about right let's say it's 25 percent, but that 25 percent won't be across the whole market there'll mm. be certain areas Pockets. where that'll be a lot higher than that and um you know and that's the key thing right so where is that going to get much higher where is that going to be much lower uh, what type of properties is that on? You know, investors are more likely to be struggling, right? Especially if they've got no tenant or um, no, there's no rent getting paid. Um, you know, we've got clients who are definitely getting no rent, uh, haven't had rent for ages. You know, um, people and so and they can't rent it out. So, you know, they're the they're the sort of problem areas. You know, and that's what you, you know, Westpac came out yesterday, 15% growth, uh, CBA trim their forecasts, etc. So, you know, they give up this this headline figure, AFR front page. Um, is the market all going to go up 50%, 15%? Definitely not. Um, is it going to go up at all? Some properties, maybe, you know, we're down, I was down in Kaima on the weekend. Are prices in Kaima going really well? Well, yeah, like there's been a, a lot of, you know, a very limited supply of what people really want, the premium end, um, and an influx of buy. It doesn't take much to move that needle, especially when they're coming with bigger borrowing capacity. So it just, it's, it's always about the micro markets and uh, it sounds pretty boring, but that's what people buy. You buy individual properties. You don't buy the market. Yeah, that's very important, of course, because um, you know the market is uh, seen as sort of some high-level thing, and you know they quote a price move in Sydney or Melbourne, and people, if if they're perhaps not paying attention, assume that means all properties are moving that that amount. But it unfortunately isn't like that. Now, let's there's touch a couple of things there that I just want to take a bit further. The supply issue first. Um, this is an interesting chart. This is actually from CBA, and this shows you the fact that there's an excess supply of property relative to demand. And what they're arguing is that that's quite new. You know, we had a significant uh, uh, story after 2008 when there was essentially a very significant issue with lack of supply. And we've now got the exact opposite. And that, of course, is demand is down partly because of international buyers. And it's also uh, because there are many uh, investors who would have bought previously and no longer are that interested. So this is, I think, a very important supply demand chart. And remember, there are still building more stuff, right? There's, I don't know, 1.2 million properties probably spare across Australia. They're still building particularly units. So um, is this a troublesome chart or what, what, what do you think? So, uh, this, you know, one of the biggest problems with housing affordability is that we have built, you know, for the affordable market. So we've bought house on, built house on Greenfield, house on land packages. Um, we cut up blocks and build townhouses and mini, uh, you know, medium density sort of, but they're not that main focus. Really what we build is high rise apartments and house and land packages. And so have we overbuilt house and land packages? Probably not um, because, you know, the people that are buying them is generally young first home buyers and, you know, that's what they really want. Have we overbuilt apartments? Without doubt. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see that with the, uh, you know, the new 25, thousand home builder right we still got and sold heaps of house and land packages uh so you know are they great investments definitely not are you gonna you know get shortage of supply out there definitely not i saw it was stockland or something releasing a huge um new three thousand uh, house and land packages this week or something um and so the apartment market yeah that's where you're going to get the oversupply no international students no investors uh young families definitely don't want to you know live in these sort of environments covid was not a uh if, you know, great uh, thing, you know, 
um, pandemic to live in a high-rise apartments with the small space, etc. So, um, yeah, 100%. We're, we've overbuilt apartments. And we've built one bedders, two bedders, studios. We haven't built three bedders, premium, smaller, a lot of lifestyle sort of. Um, these are pretty basic um, high-rises. Um, because if they were three bedders and they were, you know, maybe a couple of one bedders and two bedders and ground floor apartments and, you know, big sort of parklands and family spaces and all those sort of things, then yeah, there probably would be a lot of demand for them, but we just haven't built that. We've just built for investors and, um, you know, cheap and cheerful. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's, that's absolutely right. And, uh, here's another chart, which may, um, come in. This is the net my immigration data, right? This is from Fitch today, who basically also came out with their own price uh, forecasts of a drop of 10% or more over the next uh, year. But, but, you know, migration, net immigration is through the floor, because of course, all the borders are shut. And this was one of the forces that were driving property uh, quite strongly until relatively recently. So this is another reason why my thesis is that the uh, supply demand disequilibrium is just all over the place. Yeah, so the migration is an interesting one. So migration is a lag. So people don't just move here and buy a property. You know, arguably, there's potentially a lot of uh, Aussies overseas that are moving back, um, whether in London, Singapore, Hong Kong, United States, etc., um, Dubai. Um, you know, they are moving home from what we can see, only a limited numbers because they can't get flights, but they are moving home. And generally, they're coming home and they want to buy property. So I'd argue there's, that's going to be offset from that. Where that will hit, though, is in two or three years' time, especially if those numbers um, stay low, is that the demand that they will want in two or three years' time, once they potentially have, would have moved here, got a job, um, etc. So I think that's where that's going to get really hit. There's two sides to property demand. There's a uh, net increase in population, which, yes, that, that uh, supports the housing market, especially sort of the new house and land packages and new high-rises. Um, but then you've got just demographics, people just getting older. Um, you know, if someone who's 25, when they're 30, they want to buy their first house. Someone who's 35, when they get to 42, they want to upgrade from the apartment or the two bed house to the four bed house for teenage kids. Um, and if you look at that, there is still a, a big sort of um, uplift in um, sort of ages up until the 40s. So people are still, there's still more and more people kind of getting, uh, you know, rising, you know, the, the kind of the fat sort of pyrogram is still rising at that sort of younger. And that's where property demand is. Whereas if you look at somewhere like uh, in an aging population, people are getting older, they're sort of downsizing. That would be not great for property prices at all, right? Because people would need less space. They want to move out of the big houses, less kids, less into the market. So I'd argue though, from a demographic point of view, Australia's still got a lot of people in those sort of younger sort of family formation years that are still, no matter what happens with migration, they're going to get older and they're going to want somewhere to live with a family. So, um, yeah, there's probably that side to it as well. Right. But then the question springs to mind, what about the down traders? What about those, the baby boomers who are now in those larger properties and potentially will need to sell or want to sell? I'm certainly seeing my surveys, a large number of people think, oh, hang on, if property prices are on the way down, maybe I should bring forward that decision to sell to try and release as much equity as I can. And there are more down traders, way more down traders, looking to want to sell from my surveys than those uh, up traders or migrants uh, coming into Australia. That for me seems to be the most critical issue that uh, is not really being understood at the moment. So um, if you've lived in a property for 10 or 20 years and generally you've, uh, a lot of those down traders have got very low debt on that property because um, you know they've paid it off and they've retired, etc. Um, and they are in areas where, yes, things are a little bit more volatile. Um, there's debt and there's more stock coming on. Um, maybe it hasn't grown um, for a long time um, and they're potentially seeing more supply hit um, and you're a downsizer. You would definitely be thinking, actually, you know what? I haven't got much money in my super fund. All I've got is my house. Um, and so that type of person, yes. But if you're in a good suburb, um, you've had long-term growth, your equity is quite a lot. Um, you know, you know, you've got a good asset. You don't just go and rush it and sell it, um, you know, because you know that that'll have a huge impact on how much money you've got in retirement. So um, I also think that people will generally want to stay in their property, you know, much longer than people expect. And a lot of what their alternative option is downsizing. When you do the maths on, you know, what they want type of apartment, the location they want to live, what they're going to downsize for, 
the stress. Um, a lot of people are a bit anti-change as well. Uh, you know, they just stay in their properties. Um, and so I would say yes, in certain areas, if there is that sort of nothing in super, no other assets, um, really concerned about the property falling, and people in there are fearful and they'll rush to sell in an area where there's already uh, potentially people selling. Uh, so you have this compounding sort of spiral effect. But in other areas, a lot of people just want to sit on their hands. They'll go, well, I don't really have an alternative option. I definitely don't want to live in an apartment anymore. Um, you know, I want, you know, et cetera. And then they'll just hold out and you'll just see low stock. Um, so I think that's what you'll, you'll see the two ends of the spectrum. Right. But the, Chris, the critical issue is the relativity between those different cohorts, right? And th there is not that much data out there. I mean, my, my surveys probably are the most powerful in terms of looking at the relative mix of different cohorts and what they're actually trying to do. Um, and you take the property investors out of the circuit at the moment for the reasons we've discussed earlier uh, with there are lots of down traders and the down traders are getting twitchy because you know you're right they basically are seeing their property equity as their superannuation for later right but that for later is getting a bit close <laughs> because essentially they're getting to the point now where you know their working life is perhaps some um, uh, a bit shorter than they expected because some of them are actually out of work because of um, the COVID thing so that's that's another factor that's coming over the top um i think this is a really important demographic shift I I'm not sure that it's as clear cut as, as some people have been arguing. I'd also add affordability down the bottom end of, you know, first time buyers coming into the market or people trying to get into the market. Affordability is still all over the place. I mean, it is really, really difficult for many people to get into the market in the first place. So that's another squeeze on the supply demand equilibrium. And I just wonder when you put it all together, as I try to do, um, that's one of the reasons why I'm arguing that there's more downside than upside to prices because without the migration, without the um, steady flow of more people being able to buy at relatively cheap rates uh, and cheap values, rates can come down, but if you're dealing with a huge mortgage because prices are so high, they still can't do it, right? So that for me is the real critical thing. Now then you have to overlay geography right because they don't buy in the same places right so you've got first-time buyers often buying you know around the suburban ring you've got quite a few down traders who are actually living in houses closer into the center of town with you know big price tickets who's going to buy those that's the really interesting question for me um so there will be people there'll be people as you know who are in their 40s want to buy that place for the you know th there's those premium properties are still going to be extremely scarce. You're going to see populations still rising, etc. Um, you know, especially if they've got unique lifestyle benefits, um, and if rates are at two percent in ten years' time, there's going to be demand for them. Um, so I don't think there's going to be a problem with the the premium end, and you can already see that. You know, with the uh, you know, it's because a lot of that the market is so it's the top of the pyramid, right, and very little stock, and at the base of the pyramid, there's people where there's the, the property market is worth, say, $7 trillion. It wasn't $7 trillion before, et cetera. So I, I'm not really too concerned about the, the premium end of the market because there'll always be people willing to get into that um, that part of the market. Uh, I think you, you're right around uh, overall you need migration, you need demographics, um, and, you know, you need a pressure cooker effect. And that's what the biggest thing with, I think, the interesting thing in the market really is going, well, how does COVID affect demand? So, um we know how supply works. We know where supply is getting built. We can track that. But where do buyers' preferences? How are they going to shift? How are people going to change when they work from home? Um, how's employment going to change? Uh, how do retirees, pre-retirees think, well, you know, maybe I should move to the beach house and, you know, et cetera. So all the buyer preferences is, for me, the interesting thing that's going to come out of this. Um, the reality is if you look at what the RBA's done with all the banks around the world around cutting rates, um, you know, and all the debt that we're in now than we weren't in before. Um, you know, are we, is RBA going to cut rates to 0.1? Are they going to try to push the the bond rate down? Is banks are we going to start seeing variable rates at under two percent? Like it's it's. I would have said that, or never have seen rates at 2.5 percent, but we are. So um, that will encourage a lot of people into the market without doubt, and you'll start to see um, a lot of media start to come out soon with rent is cheaper than uh, buy, it's cheaper than renting. Um, you'll start to see a lot of uh, media just pump up the market. That will encourage demand. Um, people won't know what they're doing. Then you'll start to see, you know, so I, I don't know. I just think that 
the demand side will 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 get lit up because of low rates and uh you know people are getting back into work i don't think the uh you know melbourne's probably going to get hit harder um and then say sydney but yeah i just think you've there's the high high supply areas where there's not much demand they're in they're in problems but if you look at say central coast um is that place going to be cheaper in three years time a lot of that sort of more premium end of that market without doubt it's already moved it's already moving where you are man is that place moving without doubt the rules there's three properties on the market and there's probably 30 buyers for those three properties um etc so there's certain markets are going to stay strong a lot of the bc's and D's in premium markets, the busy roads, et cetera, already been hit quite hard. Um, but then you get opportunists. We've got a client who's trying to buy this house in Melbourne and it's in a premium suburb, but it's on a really poor street. Um, and we generally wouldn't encourage clients to go anywhere near it because whenever they get a bargain today, when you sell it, unless the market is at full FOMO, um, you know, and supply is really low and demand's off the rail, you won't get a good sale price. But right now you think, you know what, it's probably worth a gamble because you're buying it probably 300 grand under what it probably was, you know, 20% under. Um, and, you know, and, and that's probably where they want to, and they want to be in that market from a lifestyle point of view. They can, they want to, they're okay with living with the lifestyle, you know, uh, sort of negative of, of the main road, um, et cetera. So it's always opportunists who are keen to get in when the property's price fall as well. So I don't know, it's uh, lots of different markets, I guess. Yeah, different different markets and different um, scenarios for people. And in fact, Aaron's just mentioned the nucleus wealth rent versus buy calculator, which is very opportune, Aaron, because in fact, next week, I have Damien Klassen coming on from nucleus wealth. And we're going to be discussing two things. Firstly, the property calculator in more detail. And then secondly, the broader question of the, um, the financial markets and what's happening and uh, some of the uh, questions there in terms of we're in a bit of a sort of a, a holding pattern at the moment, but where is the market going to go? So that'll be worth uh, coming, coming back and catching next week with, with, with uh, Damien. That calculator, I don't know whether you've seen it, Chris, but that calculator, in my view, is the definitive property calculator in the Austra for the Australian context because you can basically compare um, renting and buying, put in different scenarios and see how all of those flows work. Um, it's a really, really you know, very powerful tool. So, um, you know, just worth uh, putting a plug in for that. So nothing, I mean, I don't know what anything to do with that calculator, but I've been a financial advisor for 13 years and um, I know not to trust forecasting and um, things don't happen in straight lines. You know, babies don't grow up on straight lines. Uh, property markets don't move in straight lines, um, etc. So um, you can get very uh, excited doing forecasting about any investment return. Um, but you know, and you could look at pre, uh, you know, past returns of apartments, say in Sydney, and go, well, all apartments go up at five percent. Even poor property, poor apartments went up at five percent. But so people will say, well, I'll base that for the next 20, 30 years, um, and you know, etc. So I would say, um, yep. You can look at those things, but the chances are you'll be way overconfident on capital growth and you'll probably assume that that's for every property um, and you'll probably, you know, put in inflation at 3%, but who said inflation is going to be 3%, um, etc. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm not usually a fan of um, those things. And if anything, those numbers will look amazing because your biggest cost will be interest and interest rates are at 2.5%. So, if you, uh, you know, and even if you put them at 3%, it still looks good. Um, so, uh, yeah, those those sort of things. Um, if anything, it's just encouraging people to enter the market and not truly understand the cost of home ownership and what you're risking. Um, mm. You've got a deposit, you're taking on a debt, um, you've got to pay principal back, which that would be interesting to see how they do that. Uh, and it all comes down to the capital value when you sell that property. Um, we'll determine whether that was a and so then it all comes down to whether you bought a good property or not. And then most people buying property don't have a clue what a good property is. They don't know how to look at aspect or light or, you know, the neighbours or privacy or, um, you know, etc. So, yeah. Well, well you know, you've taken me exactly where I, where I wanted you to take me it's to ask you this question, Chris. Um, we often talk about dog properties and, you know, A-class properties. How do you tell the difference? So it comes down to livability. Properties price on lifestyle and livability. So the livability of the area, the well-being, um, what's the benefits of living in that suburb? Now it could be something simple like school. It could be something access to the city. It could be nature. It could be, uh, 
you know, lots of different things about why you'd want to live in an area, right? Sporting, who knows, right? Um, so that's the area. Um, and that area, you also want that area to uh, have a NIMBY mentality. I know that'll probably get some, uh, you know, fighting in the background, screaming at their screens. But reality is you need that NIMBY mentality across the suburb to protect you as an investor in that suburb. Um, now, whether I agree with it or not is a different conversation, but you need... The suburb needs to have great livability plus overlaid with a NIMBY mentality. There's no point buying in an area that's got great livability, but it's going to dramatically shift over the next 10 years with lots of new high rises. For example, you look at some things around Alexandria. Okay, well, unfortunately, um, the show has gone offline, so the internet has just broken, <laughs> which means that I'm now just talking to myself. I apologize for this. This is the first time that a DFA Live has actually collapsed whilst uh, I, in mid-show. I want to apologise for the fact that we've gone off air. Um, nothing that I've done here, this is the MBN, just gone offline and has disconnected the entire internet from the uh, location here. So I apologise for that. Uh, as and when the internet comes back, I'll get this show loaded. And um, meantime, Mark Yudaris will be back on air hopefully next Tuesday at 8pm Sydney time when hopefully we'll be able to uh, talk to Damien Klassen about the property sector with his model and also talk more broadly about where the economy is going over the next uh, few weeks and months. That, I think, will be an interesting show. So thank you very much for watching and uh, my apologies for this rather abrupt end. Can't do much about it. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time. <laughs>